Welcome to yet another in the series of Perth U.S. Asia Center Foreign Policy Conversations. It seems like it's a long time since we've returned to this video format, uh, a bit of a flashback to much of the last two and a half years, uh, but it's still good to take advantage of, of this format to, to bridge distances. Uh, and as you see from the, the background of my guest today, uh, Mike Green is not here in Perth. It, it may look like he's in the mountains of Vermont or, or somewhere in Canada, uh, but actually he's in the Blue Mountains. Uh, uh, we're joined today by a colleague and friend, Dr. Michael J. Green, the CEO of the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney. Most of you will know by now that the United States Study Center and the Perth U.S. Asia Center are sister centers. We have shared DNA, both of us having been uh, initiated by an initiative of the American Australian Association uh, with support from the federal government, from our respective state governments, from our universities. In fact, the Perth U.S. Asia Center was, was largely created on the model of the United States Study Center. Uh, Mike kindly serves along with his chair on my board of directors, and I have the honor uh, along with my chair of serving, serving on the United States Study Center Board of Directors to ensure our collaboration. But uh, again, many of you may have already known this, those of you in our community. Mike is a relatively recent arrival to Australia uh, in his new role as CEO of the United States Study Center. Uh, prior to that, he has a long and distinguished career in the United States and also in Japan. He, until recently, was vice president of the Center for Strategic and International Studies where he also served as the Japan chair and the Kissinger chair. He was a professor at Georgetown University, uh, had a long and distinguished career in and out of government in Washington, uh, was the senior director for Asia and the National Security Council during the Bush administration, previously had served in, in the Pentagon, and, and really is, is one of the foremost regional specialists. And today, we would say Indo-Pacific specialists uh, uh, in, in not just the United States, but the world. Uh, we in Australia are very fortunate to have him here in his current role. Uh, the Perth U.S. Asia Centre in particular uh, is delighted to have, again, uh, Mike as an old friend and as a regional expert, uh, adding to the, the conversation that we've got. And we figured that it would be nice to have an informal chat uh, to, to get a sense for uh, Mike himself, uh, his, his new role at the United States Studies Centre, and then to talk a little bit about some trends and, and developments in the region. So, Mike, with that overly long introduction, uh, welcome. Welcome to Australia. Welcome to the Blue Mountains, clearly, where I haven't been. Clearly, you've got a, a piece of your, you must be missing your cabin in West Virginia. You, you got it. We uh, we do miss our cabin in West Virginia, but this is pretty stunning. And by the way, I did not shoot the deer um, uh, whose antlers you see behind me. And and thanks for having me, Gordon, and, and thank you also because um, you will recall that we had a conversation in my office at Georgetown when I was talking about doing a six-month sabbatical in Australia, and you said, nah, don't do six months, and sort of got this whole ball rolling, and here I am, and really loving it, so thank you. Well, look, th there couldn't be a more exciting time for you to transition to AUKUS, and I think rather than any influence I might have, it's the, the, the advent of AUKUS. Uh, you know, Australia's role in the Quad, a really increasingly ambitious Osman uh, agenda. There's an awful lot going on Australia in Australia-U.S. relations. I don't think you're going to be bored. No, it's it's um, it's a really interesting time to be working uh, in Australia, uh, on Australia, uh, in the U.S.-Australia alliance with your center uh, on the Indo-Pacific. Um, the U.S.-Australia alliance is humming uh, with activity. Um, you know, before I left CSIS, uh, I helped raise money to set up the Australia chair, which uh, Dr. Charlie Adele uh, now runs. Uh, our colleagues at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute are setting up a Washington office. Um, the U.S. Study Center is, um, you know, really building up. Um, uh, we could talk about it, but uh, a, a new leadership team because there's so much interest in everything from AUKUS to the Quad to how we, um, as allies, manage um, technology and uh, export controls, or how we talk about democracy in this region or development. So the uh, agenda for the Alliance is just exploding. And I, I did this job partly because you told me I should, mostly because you told me I should, um, uh, uh, but in large part because a lot of the agenda in Washington is um, going to be shaped here. In Australia and in Japan, and with our close allies, the 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 Biden administration is all in for allies. Their Indo-Pacific strategy mentions allies 30 times and China three times. 
Well, allies are going to want a voice in strategy. And I think in a lot of ways, Australia is innovating. Uh, uh, and so this is a great place to, to be for a while and really help with policy innovation and ideas. So it's exciting. And the fact that our two centers are Siamese twins means we can work on um, the, the US-Australia relationship, but, but in a regional context, because um, this alliance now is much more regionally focused than it has been in a long time. We did a lot of stuff together in the Middle East and elsewhere, but now we're in a contested region and we need to be we need to be doing things together like we never have. I couldn't agree with your framing more, uh, and I also couldn't agree with the, the, the tremendous potential there is just not just for collaboration between our two centers, but as you indicated, for collaboration between the United States and Australia in this region in particular in the Indo-Pacific. Um, I am um, in reflecting upon your arrival. I, I just came back myself from from Washington DC yesterday. I had a chance to to benefit from your establishment of the the Australia chair at CSIS. Charlie Adele and his colleagues organized an America Australia Indo Pacific Strategy Dialogue at CSIS last week, last Thursday and Friday, which I participated in. I just got back to Perth on Monday. Um, it, it, it's interesting to me that I'm now realizing that I'm nine years removed from Washington DC. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm only, only half jokingly tell people that your arrival indicates that that Australia needed an upgraded yank, right? You needed a different perspective. You're a lot more current in Washington, D.C. Um, most of my friends in D.C. thought I was prescient because I got out before the Trump era. Uh, but that means I don't have the same battle scars that you did. I didn't go through that period in the same way that you did. I wonder if I might just start off with asking you to reflect on what I understand is your hometown, Washington. Uh, it, it's been through a lot in the last five, six years. Uh, can you tell us wh where you think Washington is right now, where you think it's going, uh, and then bring that back to Australia in terms of that relationship that you've already identified? Well, I, I did grow up in D.C., in Washington, D.C., and, and then the Maryland suburbs, Chevy Chase and Bethesda, which is where my family lived before I moved here. <clears throat> you know, and I grew up, I, I'm old enough that I remember the Washington Senators baseball team. So I, I not only do I have scars from the politics, but I have scars from um, heartbreak and hope for our sports teams. Um, but I'll spare the audience a sort of Arizona versus Washington sports rivalry discussion. <clears throat> um, my mom uh, was a conservative Republican. She campaigned for Barry Goldwater, Richard Nixon. My dad was a Democrat. He campaigned for John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, um, Jimmy Carter, worked for Robert Kennedy. Um, and um, uh, so I grew up in a household where we debated politics all the time, and um, really great dinner debates um, about politics, especially at election time. Um, but my, my mom was, uh, and my dad were both in uh, government service and believed very, very strongly in service despite their partisan differences. So um, I, I came up loving political fights, but it ends at the water's edge. And when it comes to national security and service, you know, you serve. And and, and um, I still really, really believe in that. And um, it made the Trump years painful, to be honest, because I had worked for President Bush. And then I worked on John McCain's campaign and Mitt Rodney's campaign and the Republican Party. I'm an independent, but a sort of center right independent. Um, the Republican Party um, is in a civil war. And it's well, it's well covered in the Australian media. Um, and it's hard not to with Donald Trump and uh, the Make America Great Again movement, um, you know, producing some pretty shocking um, uh, narratives, but also some pretty shocking candidates, as you see in the midterm elections coming up. Um, some of the candidates in your home state of Arizona in particular are pretty shocking, especially to traditional Republicans. Um, it's painful um, to watch, um, but what doesn't get covered in Australia is is what's happening in the Democratic Party, frankly. Not quite as shocking, but the progressive uh, caucus of the Democratic Party uh, 20 years ago was five people, and now it's the second largest caucus in the Democratic Party, larger than the blue dog conservative Democrats, larger than the pro-trade Democrats. So there's been a polarization at both ends. Um, uh, you know, as I said, more shocking on the Republican side, but but the fact that there's polarization on the progressive side um, makes it hard for the Republicans to recover because there's a constant diet of progressive agenda items that 
just enraged conservative Americans. And so this, the extremes, in other words, are really defining the political debate, which is not healthy and it's not unique to the US. Um, and um, it, 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 it's polarizing and it's painful and it's personal and families, my family included, are increasingly, it's hard to have a divided political family like I grew up in where you'd have a good debate about Jimmy Carter versus Ronald Reagan, and then you'd all go out and play baseball together. Now it's personal and families are divided and Thanksgiving dinners are awkward and uh, and it's painful. That said, um, when you ask where Washington is going, um, there has never been in Congress, in think tanks, there has never been more support for our alliances in Asia. We just uh, completed a survey at the US Study Center we'll publish um, before the midterms uh, in November uh, of American, Japanese, and Australian public views on American democracy, on China, on trade, on defense. Um, and it, it, our, our survey showed that, um, what other surveys show, that Americans have never been more unified around the importance of alliances, especially top of the list, Australia. Um, that includes Japan, includes Korea, uh, I worked in the Pentagon in the 90s when the Cold War was over. It was a hard sell to the public that our alliances mattered. Um, it, so that that is a very powerful uh, trajectory in American uh, strategic thinking. Um, our polls showed that a majority of Americans favored TPP still, and that majority of Trump voters think that we should expand trade uh, with our partners in, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, so uh, even if you look at the Trump administration, uh, below the surface, there was huge continuity from the end of Obama. You know, the, the senior officials managing national security and relations with Australia and the Indo-Pacific, H.R. McMaster, the national security advisor, Matt Pottinger, they largely continued elements that they liked from the Obama administration. And if you look at the Biden administration, and the Indo-Pacific strategy, it picks up a lot of things like the Quad, like the Indo-Pacific strategy that were Trump era initiatives. And that, by the way, came from Japan and Australia, a lot of these ideas. So there's much more continuity. There's much more bipartisanship around alliances, around competing with China, frankly, around the importance of democracy and even the importance of trade than ever before. But the partisanship and the polarization makes it very, very hard to get a consensus around new things like trade agreements. Um, so it's 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 dysfunctional, and yet there's a lot of continuity, and in some ways, an even stronger uh, sense of uh, engagement in the Indo-Pacific than ever before. So at the U.S. Studies Center, we're trying to get past the headlines, make sense of all that, don't camouflage the ugly parts, but also point out where there are huge opportunities for American allies and partners because. The American people, the American Congress, fundamentally think this region matters and think Australia and our allies matter. Well, thanks for that that um, slightly optimistic take <laughs> because uh, it has been needed. Um, I wonder if I might push you a little bit on that. I'm curious, we're, we're facing the midterms. I know that the United States Study Center has been very much focused on the midterms. Uh, and then in just over two years, another presidential election. Mm. Uh, my own view in my post uh, Trump kind of returns to Washington, D.C., is that there's been this snapback to normalcy. You know, the, you know, the adults are in control, that there's government agencies doing what those government agencies are supposed to do type of feeling, right? At the same time, there's also this kind of niggling feeling in the back of the head that the <laughs> barbarians at the gate, right? That all of a sudden that, you know, th those candidates that you referred to in Arizona, Carrie Lake for governor or Blake Masters for, for Senate, if they get in or, or if the Republicans come back into power, that it wouldn't be Trump, it would be something worse. And so I'm kind of curious. I do know that probably in Australia real, real, writ large and in American allies throughout the region, there is this ongoing sense of anxiety as to, you know, what what, what is the new normal? Is it yeah. a, a Biden administration or is it something yet to come? So we have a event, if I can advertise it, on October 26th in Canberra, and it will be a webcast on the midterms and what it means for the region and for Australia. We've done these public opinion polls so we can look at how Americans, Australians and Japanese um, think about all the issues we're talking about. And we'll also have um, uh, Jane Koston from The New York Times, Ron Brownstein from The Atlantic, uh, giving a real insider's um, preview of what to look for in the midterm elections and how to read 
the mechanics and turnout, uh, but also the zeitgeist and sort of, you know, ideological and philosophical um, debates that are churning in this midterm. It certainly looks like the Republicans, true to historical pattern, will win the House of Representatives. Um, it, it almost always happens that a president uh, loses their first midterm. Um, last time that didn't happen was George W. Bush in 2002, but a lot of that was because of 9-11. So it, it looks like the Republicans will win the House, but by less than many people thought. It'll be a squeaker, actually. And part of that is um, pushback by the electorate against some of the um, recent moves by the Supreme Court, the, the abortion decision um, uh, in particular, which um, outraged a lot of women. And in America, we don't have compulsory voting, so turnout matters. Newly registered voters after that Supreme Court decision uh, were um, uh, uh, much higher among women, 70% higher among women, because they're outraged by that decision. There's going to be some pushback. It's going to hurt the Republicans. And then the Trump uh, candidates who have an easier time getting through a Republican primary in a state like yours, Arizona, uh, because of the extreme um, uh, uh, positions within the party. So they can, so Trump vote, Trump people can win primaries in some states very Trumpy sort of um, candidates, um, but they're going to have a very hard time winning uh, in a general election. And all the news that Donald Trump himself is generating yeah. is very negative. It's a negative drag on the Republicans. So um, they'll win the House probably, but it'll be close, closer than they want. And then in the Senate, it's a toss up, but you can see Senate Majority McConnell is barely able to disguise his frustration with Donald Trump for basically poisoning the Republicans' chance to win the Senate. So what does that mean? If Let's say we end up with, just for the sake of argument, a Republican House and a split Senate, 50-50, which is statistically the most likely outcome right now uh, as we speak in uh, late September. Well, I think the Republican House will, if it's a close call, will, be, will have relatively more um, Freedom Caucus right-wing members because the moderates are going to lose to Democrats. So it'll be a little Trumpier majority, but it'll be a smaller majority. Um, they will, the speaker, if he is the speaker, um, is going to have to listen to that wing. And what do they want? They want investigations of Hunter Biden. They want, um, you know, they're going to want political uh, entertainment going after Biden. And, and you'll have a lot of that, and it'll look really ugly, and it'll be uh, polarizing. But the majority of the Republicans who come into the House, and particularly the committee leadership for defense and foreign affairs and trade, they're going to push the Biden administration to do more on defense, to do more on allies, and potentially, and this is a longer discussion, more on trade. So it's not all bad uh, if the Republicans win. And I, growing up in a politically divided family, am kind of a fan of divided government. When I was in the government, I didn't like it. But outside the government, it, the Congress can keep the administration honest. And, and um, you know, I, I sit sort of on the center right. I think that the Biden administration needs a little bit of disciplining, um, a little bit of pressure to increase defense spending to make the alliances, to make AUKUS work better, for example, um, and potentially IPEF and trade agreements. Um, uh, then you asked about 2024, um, you know, it depends on the economy so much. And, you know, are we going to have a recession? Very possibly. Will it be over in time? Will we be recovering so that the incumbent Democratic Party gets a boost going into 2024? That's a really important variable. Um, the Republicans, uh, if you had the primary votes right now, Trump would probably be the nominee. But you can also see clearly in the polls that Trump's support is slowly hemorrhaging. Um, if you look at the polls, fewer and fewer Republicans, still a majority, but fewer and fewer want him to run. A majority, almost uh, two thirds of the public don't want him to run at all. Um, and so you have people like Ron DeSantis in Florida who are trying to do the, he's the governor, trying to do the Trump Act. Uh, he may not be the guy, it could be someone else. Whoever wins the Republican primary is gonna have to imitate Trump, I think, to some extent. So liberals think, well, great, we end up with someone like Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida, who's Trumpy, but unlike Donald Trump, actually knows how to do things. So we'll have a really dangerous president who can actually do dangerous things. On the right, people would say, 
you have to imitate Trump to get nominated in the Republican Party. And DeSantis has a lot of Trumpy. He's really out trumping Trump with these 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 ploys like shipping immigrants to Nantucket, where there are a lot of liberals and it plays well on Fox News. But if you look at how he governs Florida, he's pretty serious on economic development. He's pretty serious on um, uh, climate change, even. So yeah, we'll get a we'll get a Trumpy-ish guy, but he'll actually know how to govern. So we'll see. Um, I'm um, I'm sort of in the middle. Uh, and then on the Democratic side, you know, most Democratic voters now in some polls think Trump, uh, Biden's too old to run again. And he has kind of the most important base for Democrats is the African-American community where Biden's doing OK and younger voters and younger voters are souring on Biden. So um, he can't say he's not going to run because it'll be a lame duck if he does. Um, if he runs, it really depends on how he's looking. He'll be pretty old. Um, uh, it's kind of his to lose still. Uh, Vice President Harris would be the logical next person, but the political polls and the political pundits, broadly speaking, think she's just not got the the juice. She had a good trip to Asia, I thought. I don't know what you thought of her visit to Korea. I thought she was very good, but she's just not got the political juice. There are some very good Democratic uh, governors and mayors uh, who would be really credible candidates. Um, uh, it, will Donald Trump be president again? It's possible. It's possible. I think personally, it's it's pretty unlikely, but it is possible. Yeah. And if we have a bad economy and a lot of grievances, um, and if if Joe Biden does run and he's not up to it anymore, you know, Trump could come back. It's not impossible. But I think it's it's I don't know. I'd give it a ten to twenty percent chance to be honest right now. But it depends on a lot of factors. Well, we're looking forward to the USSC midterm event. Uh, uh, we at the Perth US Asia Center have always benefited tremendously from the, the quality of the research put out by your organization, by the United States Studies Center, and, and frequently entice you and your colleagues out here to Western Australia to join us. Uh, one of the reasons we're doing this, this video conference uh, from your cabin and from my home here rather than in person is that our schedules are, are not meshing well for the, for the rest of this year with travel and other obligations. Uh, but I do hope to get you out here for an in-person event and lecture early next year. Um, and we were successful uh, just last month in bringing you out. You kindly participated in our Indian Ocean Defense and Security Conference and spoke there, but also at a, at a roundtable we did on the Indian Ocean. So I wonder if I might turn the conversation now a bit back to towards the region where you and I had spent most of our time. Uh, both of us actually spent most of our time initially on Northeast Asia, you know, Japan, Korea, uh, China, that area. Uh, but I do know that you were in the White House during the, the uh, Indian Ocean tsunami. Uh, and increasingly, like most of the region, you're recognizing that the Indo-Pacific is, at its core, a recognition that you can't understand the Asia Pacific in isolation. You really need to understand the rise of India, uh, the, the Indian Ocean, and that that what Abe, Abe would, would consider yeah. to have been a confluence of these two oceans is increasingly important. So I wonder if I might get just very briefly your reflections on having joined us here in Perth for the Indian Ocean Defense and Security Conference, uh, what you see is the importance uh, of the Indian Ocean and any key trends that you would like to highlight. Yeah, I, I was really impressed with that conference, Gordon. It was really, it was a beautiful venue uh, overlooking the, the harbor and the turnout was very impressive and the discussions were, were good. And when you're in Perth or Western Australia, your, your map changes. <laughs> And you really do see you're at the confluence of the Pacific and Indian Oceans. And just, I mean, I'm a strategic guy. I like to think I've written a lot of history of U.S. strategy and I, I, I like geography and maps. It just changes how you think about opportunities and also um, contestation with a rising China. Um, I do find you think less about our old friend North Korea when you're in Perth. Yeah. <laughs> Your your main area of expertise originally. We're, um, technically, we're, we're technically not out of range, but we're not yes. a really high priority target for <laughs> Kim Jong Un. No. <laughs> um, so I really enjoyed it, and I thought the, the Indo Pacific framing is really useful. And um, th that term Indo Pacific, um, uh, in the last book I wrote before I came here, was on Japan. It was on Abe's grand strategy, and I traced uh, the origins of Abe's proposal for a free and open Indo Pacific strategy. And uh, a Japanese foreign ministry think tank actually did a deep, deep review of where this came from. And one of the people they credited was our friend Rory Metcalf, 
at the National Security College who's been pushing this idea of the Indo-Pacific, and he he finally won. Um, so it's it's a very very useful concept uh, and strategic frame. It it you know you mentioned the Quad when I came into the Bush administration um, in two thousand one. Um, I was offered a, a job by um, Condi Rice, but um, this was, if you'll recall, in 2000, Bush versus Gore in the Supreme Court, very close race in Florida. And as part of our political museum at the U.S. Study Center, we actually have an original voting booth from uh, Florida with a hanging chat and everything. If you come visit, you can see it. <clears throat> um, and um, in that period, while Bush and Gore were, um, were um, contesting the election in the Supreme Court, um, and uh, and the teams were getting ready to govern. Uh, I was actually um, uh, on the list for Gore too, because uh, I ended up working with Bush because he won. But at that point, thinking about alliances was pretty bipartisan, and both the Bush and Gore team wanted to strengthen our relationship, and both of them were thinking a lot about India in particular. And Bush's team, which I was not on during the election, the so-called Vulcans would meet. And people like Rich Armitage and, uh, and 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 Bob Blackwell and others, and Condi Rice, really were big on India. Um, they were thinking about India as a counterweight to China, and not as an ally, but just an India that's a net exporter of security, that's that's resilient and helps add resilience in the in the Indian Ocean region. You know, sort of limits Beijing's options to coerce and cause some trouble and, and, and will help encourage uh, uh, an approach to China where we're cooperating rather than competing. So it was not a containment strategy. It was not an alliance strategy. It was just the idea that India matters and an India that's successful is good for all of us. So when you talk about the Indian Ocean and Indo-Pacific, there's a geopolitical dimension, which to me is about India and the role of India. Um, and uh, then there's the geographic dimension, which is about the importance of the Indian Ocean um, itself. Um, Andrew Shearer and I wrote a piece in the Washington Quarterly, Andrew's now Director General of ONI, um, uh, about the strategic importance of the Indian Ocean. We did it in 2009, I think. Um, the Obama administration actually had a gathering to decide Indian Ocean strategy because the Pentagon uh, had decided and announced that we need an Indian Ocean strategy, and they couldn't agree on what our Indian Ocean strategy would be. Is it stewardship of the environment? Is it commerce and trade agreements? Is it governance? Is it security? They, there was not a cohesive view. Andrew and I tried to write a, a strategy that would sort of capture why the Indian Ocean matters geographically. And we focused on the Indian Ocean uh, as a historic transit point uh, for major powers. And 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 we should be worried about the so-called string of pearls, Chinese dual-use bases. The Indians are certainly worried. So that has always mattered to the U.S. and Australia in World War One and World War Two and the Cold War, as our as as the critical space that links our CENTCOM, Europe, AFRICOM with Indo-Pacific, that 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 also uh, provides um, uh, a critical sea lanes. Um, and uh, and frankly, control of the Straits of Malacca and choke points. If you if you are contesting the Indian Ocean, you can't handle handle you know the choke points in the Western Pacific, and and even relates to Taiwan, and Taiwan and and Japan, Northeast Asian contingencies. Because if the U.S. Navy, the, 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 Australia, Japan are worried about the Indian Ocean, we're not going to be able to focus our resources on defending our interests in the Western Pacific. So it has many many geopolitical uh, dimensions, but also has geographic importance in terms of security. And then on top of that, and this is where I think your center has really changed the narrative in an important way, enormous opportunities, huge opportunities in terms of clean energy and all the things that your center works on. I'm here to advertise my center, not yours. But <laughs> um, uh, I think what the Perth US Asia centers really put on the mental map for Australians and Americans and Japanese and others is, yeah, it's a contested, uh, arena, geographically, geopolitically, but it's also an you arena know, with enormous potential for cooperation on things like clean energy, managing migration, tech, that will move us towards a net positive outcome. So um, kudos for the work on that. I think this your center's really, really changed the narrative. Uh, 
I appreciate that framing. Um, number one, um, we're, this gives me a clear indication of why we're so eager to have you out and visiting us in what we call Australia's Indian Ocean capital as often as possible because those issues are important. But you're absolutely correct that Japanese interest, Korean interest, Indian interest, Southeast Asian interest in Australia more broadly, but particularly in Western Australia is driven by solar, by lithium, by critical materials, by the you know, security of supply chains, and a whole range of issues in that region. Uh, and so I anticipate that that this conversation will only grow as we go forward. Look, there are uh, many, many issues that I'd love to keep going talking on, but we've already quickly hit the 30 minute mark. Uh, you know, we, we have an ongoing uh, defense strategic review. You had a chance to, to meet with Stephen Smith, uh, former defense minister and former chief of our defense forces, uh, Sir Angus Houston, while you were out here. Um, we've also got kind of these broader questions around uh, defense industry, the alliance itself, where it's going. But those are all things that you work on day to day. Mm -hmm. We are going to regularly be steering our community uh, to benefit from the research and work being done at the United States Study Center. I want to wrap up with an, one uh, final question, which I know that our, our community will be very interested in. That's, you're not the only recent high profile American to recently arrive on Australian shores. Uh, ambassador Caroline Kennedy uh, has arrived to be the new United States ambassador. She'll be out in Western Australia relatively soon. Um, I, I do know that because you you and I will actually be one of the few people who will get this reference. She's what I would call a reverse Tom Schieffer. Yeah. Tom Schieffer yeah. had been the U.S. ambassador to Australia. He was George W. Bush's baseball partner in, in owning the, the Texas Rangers. Uh, served here in Australia before going on to a very successful tenure as the U.S. ambassador to Japan. Uh, we have in Ambassador Kennedy somebody who has been focused primarily on in the media as a celebrity, but the reality is is an experienced ambassador in her own right. Had had a tenure uh, in Japan before now her her current uh, tour as U.S. ambassador to to Australia. You obviously work very closely with her as a Japan specialist. Uh, in in her position there. I wonder if you might give us a sense for what you think her priorities will be and what she's bringing to Australia from her experience as an ambassador in Japan. Well, one obvious thing is you used to graduate from being ambassador in Canberra to being ambassador in Tokyo, but now you graduate from Tokyo and when you get promoted, you move to Canberra. So that's a big, <laughs> big switch. Um, uh, I... Uh, uh, got to know Ambassador Kennedy pretty well in Tokyo, um, and and uh, uh, she came to see me uh, as soon as she was nominated, and and we hit up a, a, a rapport, and um, she invited me. I was in Tokyo for the summer uh, when she began her ambassadorship. She invited me and the family over to the residence um, so the kids could swim in the pool, and my wife Eileen and I could have uh, have lunch and talk about Japan with Ambassador Kennedy. And I walked into the residence, which you've been to in Tokyo, the ambassador's residence, and went to that um, that cozy den with a fireplace. And she had pictures, the, the iconic picture of her holding her mom's hand at her father's funeral and things like that. And I just was overwhelmed because my dad worked for Robert Kennedy. And I'll tell you candidly, the, one of the only times I saw my dad cry was when Robert F. Kennedy was shot. I was very, very little, but I still remember it. And this was Caroline Kennedy, who for Americans, even center right Americans like me, is iconic. And and then she played with my kids. <laughs> you know, she was she, as you, you she was the most down to earth, unassuming, friendly, famous person I think I've ever met. And people weren't sure how that would work in Japan, but it really it really worked. People liked her. And of course, now she has the experience of being ambassador during the Abe era when so many critical national security and trade issues, hard, hard issues, really were at play in the US-Japan alliance. So she's now very experienced in those sets of issues. Um, and she and she brings that sort of wonderful personality to Australia. I think people really like her, are gonna really like her. I I have to say, Gordon, I, I watch the Japanese public and media and and, I, I think Australians may be a little bit more um, excited about Camelot and the Kennedy thing than the Japanese were. And um, part of it, part of it, I, I'm beginning to think was the space, the space race and John F. Kennedy's, uh, um, we're gonna go to the moon speech, which when you talk to Australians of a certain age was really powerful. 
And then, of course, we developed in the 70s a very deep relationship on on intelligence, but space more broadly with Australia. And I remember I was in the gallery when Julia Gillard gave her um, speech to a joint session of Congress, and she started with what it was like as a little girl watching the Apollo mission and all that. And it, did, and it, it was a it was a wonderful speech. It was really well received on a bipartisan basis. So I think in some ways um, she, she, she's going to resonate even more in Australia is my sense. She's wonderful. And she's been very supportive of the center. And I told her, um, I'm going to say things about the U.S. that you can't say, uh, as I just did to you, about polarization, about the challenges in our democracy. And the reason is because we want our alliance to work and we want Australia to navigate American politics. We want Australia to be able to to to, to shape the alliance. And um, you and I, and I think everybody who knows Australia are very confident that Australian views, and I think Japanese views and Korean views of what we should do in this region are the right ones and that will really uh, be important. And so uh, she was very supportive of that, frankly, because she 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 knows that America's big and complicated. She's lived through all the aspects of American politics herself. And one of the things I really hope to do at the center is be a really quite candid about what's happening in American politics, good, bad, and ugly, um, uh, because I don't think Australia is going to de align from the U.S. I think just the, just the, the transition from Scott Morrison to Albanese shows that. Australia is pretty much all in for the alliance. Um, to the extent there's a plan B, it's do more with Japan and India, which you and I would both say is a really good plan B. <laughs> it doesn't it, contradict plan A. Um, and so uh, I'm hoping that we uh, at the center um, describe America in a way that um, that makes the alliance more effective because it's a big, complicated country. As as Lord Carrington, the British Foreign Secretary, told his NATO colleagues while they were all complaining about America in the Reagan era, yes, yes, everything you say about America is true, but it's the only Americans we have. So, um, and then with your center, I'm really looking forward to ways to connect that to how we work together in the Indo-Pacific, which is, as I said earlier, a much bigger part of what we do with Australia than before. When I was in the White House, really quickly, sorry, not surprisingly, I spent at least as much time on Iraq and Afghanistan with my Australian counterparts as I did on the what we then called Asia Pacific. It's all it's it's the Indo-Pacific now, and it's it's what our alliance has to really get right. Well, I couldn't agree more with you about that transition, uh, both in, in the relationship between Australia and the U.S. itself, but in the focus of that relationship in this region. Uh, for us, uh, you know, the e further expanding you know, relationships between Australia and, and India, between Australia and Japan, between Australia and Korea is actually part of Plan A. It's not a it's certainly not a plan. Exactly. Never. I, I would note. Uh, Going back to your space references, that there, there's that people are probably already giving you a list of movies and things you need to see upon your arrival in Australia. You probably need to add the disc, uh, the disc rather to that, just to make sure you've got. You've already seen that, I hope. I've seen it, and I'm told that it's all made up, but still a great story. Okay. Well, what's not made up is that that uh, Perth it will still cling to its reputation as the city that kept the lights on because when John Glenn did his famous flyover, you know, the people left their lights on all night long so we could see Perth. And so that awesome. was our that was our great claim to fame for the space era. And a Mike, lot a lot fewer lights then too, I bet. Uh, indeed, <laughs> a much smaller place, but uh, uh, in, in uh, the vast expanses of the state, still noticeable by 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 uh, define. Mike, a wonderful conversation. We really look forward to working closely with you. We look forward to your next visit to Western Australia in person. Uh, but in the meantime, appreciate you taking the time for this conversation to share uh, in our next newsletter with, with our community here at the Perth U.S. Asia Center. Uh, look forward to um, uh, your upcoming work at, at the United States Study Center. Um, and, and thanks again. Appreciate it. Really looking forward to working with you once again, Gordon. Thank you.